Okay, so next we would like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Rob Wolf. Rob is a former research biochemist, and he is the New York Times bestselling author, author of The Paleo Solution. He is the founder of the City Zero Project, and he has transformed the lives of hundreds of thousands of people around the world through his top-ranked podcast, book, and seminars. He's a review editor for the Journal of Nutrition and Metabolism and has co-founded the nutrition and athletic training journal called The Performance Menu. He's a co-owner of the Northern California Strength and Conditioning, which has been ranked within the top 30 gyms in America. He coaches athletes at the highest levels of competition and consults with Olympians and world, championship, world champions in mixed martial arts, motocross, rowing, and triathlon. He's given seminars in nutrition and strength and conditioning to various entities including NASA, Naval Special Warfare, the Canadian Light Infantry, and the U.S. Marine Corps. Please, welcome, please join me in welcoming Rob Wolf. Thank you. You would think with a bio like that I would be taller than five foot nine, but unfortunately that is not the case. Um, huge honor to be here. Uh, when Akil contacted me, he said, hey, uh, do you want to come to UCSF and do some stuff? I said, don't you have a plumber there or somebody to deal with the bathrooms? And he said, yeah, we do. We want you to talk about evolutionary medicine. I'm like, with these guys? Like, I'm absolutely the, uh, the lowest wrong on the totem pole. Everybody else who's going to speak today, I might be qualified to carry their gym bag. But <laughs> Chris Masterjohn is an amazing salsa dancer, so I don't even know if I rank carrying his gym bag. So uh, anyway, it's, it's fascinating. Um, I just realized that uh, this summer, it will be 18 years ago that I first got exposed to this paleo diet evolutionary medicine concept. A uh, personal health crisis that I was facing uh, really brought me to a point of desperation trying to figure out, you know, what am I going to do to not die in my, my early, uh, or I guess mid-20s at that point. I had ulcerative colitis, high blood pressure. Uh, uh, the ulcerative colitis was so bad, I'm about 170 pounds right now. I was 130, 135 pounds from malabsorption. And I was eating as much food as I possibly could, but everything that went in, went out largely unchanged. And to say that I was desperate is a complete understatement. And literally uh, uh, sitting outside thinking about what I needed to do, um, I, I had just finished up a phone conversation with my mother who we had known had, had uh, suffered from a variety of health concerns for a number of years. We just discovered that she had celiac disease. Uh, her rheumatologist said that she was reactive to grains, legumes, and dairy. I was thinking, grains, legumes, and dairy, what, the, what in God's green earth do you eat if you don't eat grains, legumes, and dairy? So I was sitting there thinking about that, and I was vegan at the time, too, so I was really just like, whoa. And uh, I thought, no grains, no legumes, no dairy. Where did that stuff pop up? Farming. When did farming pop up? The Neolithic. What happened before the Neolithic? The Paleolithic, and it was just this, this kind of uh, stream of consciousness, and I went inside, and I, I booted up my computer, and I waited for the dial-up to work, and then uh, there was this new gizmo called Google, and I put into Google the search term Paleolithic diet. I found these two guys, Arthur Devaney and Lauren Cordain. Arthur was an economist uh, who had written extensively on this concept of the evolutionary or paleolithic diet. Lauren Cordain was a, a researcher who at that point was, I, I think he had a couple of papers on like the atherogenic potential of peanut oil and not much else, like maybe some creatine. He was transitioning out of his exercise physiology research after reading Boyd Eaton's book and, and uh, kind of collaborating with Boyd Eaton for a period of time and he was just kind of launching into this paleo diet research. And uh, I reached out to him and said, I want to be your grad student. And he said, I'm not really taking grad students. And I'm like, yeah, you are, because I'm driving, I'm in Boise, Idaho, driving from uh, uh, Seattle, and I'm going to be on your doorstep in like three days. And after wearing the guy down or intimidating him or something, um, he finally took me on. We did some great work, and uh, I took kind of a, a right turn out of academia and founded the first and fourth CrossFit gyms in the world 
uh, because I'm just kind of a lug nut. I like lifting weights and being in the gym, and I also like being in a lab, which is why I have virtually no social skills to speak of, because <laughs> that's where I spend most of my time. But uh, I, I really had an opportunity to get this uh, evolutionary medicine idea out to literally millions of people uh, by, by working with CrossFit and starting a blog and po podcasts and stuff like that. And 18 years ago, I, when I first kind of stumbled on this idea, I don't know if there were 400 people in the world that knew about this. And we have 400 people today in this room talking about this. So it's really a, a momentous event. Um, I don't know, uh, I don't actually have the, the talk is not on my screen currently. Oh. Just. There. There we go. Thank you. Thank you, uh, unknown hand of help up there. Um, <laughs> lot, lots of bad things happen when, when help comes from nowhere and you, you draw uh, uh, spurious conclusions from it. But um, <laughs> normally, normally this talk is kind of geared towards hospitals, hospital systems, and physicians. And it's usually kind of a uh, blunt hammer type instrument that I use to try to uh, uh, get some buy-in on this concept. Clearly, um, we have folks that are reasonably bought in because they drove and traveled and paid money to, to be here. But the, uh, it's, um, it, we're in, we live in interesting times because I'll, I'll make the point that medicine is just a sub-discipline of biology and what is the guiding tenet of biology. I'm actually getting ahead of myself. I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. But if we were having a conversation today about physics, we would talk about quantum mechanics and statistical mechanics, maybe a little bit of, of cosmology. Um, if we were having a discussion about geology, we would talk about continental drift and, and you know the, these core fundamental uh, uh, concepts, which are the epistemological glue four branches of science. In, in chemistry, it's crystal field theory and, and uh, 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 Arrhenius-based you know, theory and stuff like that. Uh, in medicine, we really don't have an underlying governing theory. But it, it should, I, I would make the argument that it should be evolutionary medicine. Uh, Theodosius Dobzhansky uh, observed that nothing in biology makes sense except through the light of evolution. Um, clearly, uh, uh, Charles Dar Darwin is credited with uh, the postulate of evolution via natural selection. But where is the Darwinian medicine? Uh, most physicians hear virtually nothing about this. It's really, if there's anything that occurs with regards to evolution, evolutionary theory, it's kind of peripheral to the process instead of central governing to the process. And I would argue that uh, we've made incredible strides dealing with acute medical conditions. If you get hit by a bus, shot, fall off a building, we can save your life in amazing ways. But when we look at the success we've had with chronic degenerative disease, it's appalling. Um, my iPhone gets faster, cheaper, better, day by day. This thing is out of date as, as soon as the, the thing launches. And yet in most of medicine, medicine gets more expensive and poorer in quality relative to many of the things that we, we see around us. And my argument is that we should see something like Moore's Law in medicine, but it will only occur when we apply the evolutionary framework to, to start asking questions. I don't think the evolutionary framework is perfect in answering the questions. This is where our standard, somewhat reductionist scientific method comes into play. But um, Again, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. So uh, I, I like to ask the question, are humans exempt from evolution? And in the United States, uh, uh, even talking about the concept of evolution can get you in hot water. If I'm on the two coasts, I'm usually pretty comfortable with that. When I'm more <laughs> central in the country, I usually start talking about nature and, and uh, kind of <laughs> circumvent that. But you know, interestingly, um, there was a recent study that, that just uh, uh, I, I forget the exact number, but there was something that was thrown out that um, fewer than 14% of Americans believe in evolution in, in its kind of pure form. And then there's a certain number of people who believe in intelligent design, and then there's an enormous number of people who think that it, it's, uh, it, it's a, a fabricated uh, an idea with, with no scientific backing. Um, but if you reframe the question, 
uh, pertaining to animals, non-human animals, that number changes dramatically. So there really is this bias. People are okay with this idea that everything else is governed by nature and evolution, but when you start talking about me, it doesn't really apply, but it's just kind of an interesting aside. But the times are changing. Uh, uh, Stanford Medical School has, has um, been making some pushes for an integrated Darwinian medicine program. Harvard has some pushes in that regard. Today, we have a number of, I, I think most of you folks are healthcare providers. Is it number of healthcare providers in the audience? Wow, holy smokes. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, Darwinian medicine idea is kind of catching on, apparently. Um, I'll be able to retire and go coconut farming here in no time. So that's, that's fantastic. Thank you guys for your work. Um, so, it, you know, a basic tenet of this idea of Darwinian medicine is this idea of discordance. And if we look at this proposed human timeline, pre-human uh, uh, timeline, we have millions and millions of years that formed um, genetic, epigenetic signaling that now we, we have a very thin slice of time in which we face sleep, food, activity levels, gut microbiome exposures that are completely different than at any point in our history. And I mean shockingly different. Now an important point to make, and this is something that has been made incorrectly in the past, just because something changes for an organism does not mean that it's deleterious. A change in the environment could be positive, negative, could be neutral. Could be a mix of those things, depending on what we're talking about. So just because things change doesn't necessarily mean that the, the process is deleterious, but I, I think that when we look around at our, our health, then we can make some, some pretty good arguments that, that things have kind of gone in a, a poor direction. So, I'm going to start this all off, and I'm actually going to pull from a lot of uh, Stefan Lindeberg's work. He's an MD, PhD, who uh, did most of the Catawba diet research. And I'm going to start this from kind of an anthropological observation perspective. Observation, anthropology, epidemiology are great starting points, but they're not the end point. This is just where we do hypothesis generation. This is where we ask questions. What I will throw out there is that without these anthropological kind of evolutionarily informed um, observations, that we are not even remotely on the right page to begin asking the right questions. That's kind of my, my I guess my uh, big takeaway from this. So there's some observations that contemporary and ancestral hunter-gatherers were largely free from modern illness. The transition to the agrarian life layer resulted in an increase in illness. Um, I, this is an often controversial topic for virtually everybody in the audience. And then if you wander over to an anthropology department, you say, was the transition to the agrarian life way a deleterious process for the human species? And the anthropology department folks are looking at me like, is Aston Kutcher around here? Is somebody trying to pump me? Like, why? yeah, clearly, you know, this is just baked in the cake, obvious stuff. Um, it's, it's completely unknown in most of the circles outside of that. And they have this thing called the Russian literature paradox, which is my little kind of thought experiment. If for some you know, ungodly reason we, we came here today to talk about mid 18th century Russian literature, and I asked you, what do you think about the changes in syntax and grammar of mid 18th century Russian literature? What would you say? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Or may I have a sharp object to kill myself? You know, one or the one or the other. A reasonable answer would be I have no idea what to even say about that because I know nothing about it. Interestingly, people will commentate about this kind of evolutionary process and, and the uh, historical and anthropological observations related to the development of our species, even though they have nothing beyond maybe a Discovery Channel exposure to it. And this is, these are doctors and, and researchers and whatnot. So I would just make the argument that maybe folks need to actually read and be exposed to some of the, the material on this topic. And I, I just throw out a, a really crazy controversial idea. Could changes relative to the ancestral environment cause pathogenic epigenetic signaling? Could this be a root cause problem? Maybe it's not. I think it probably is but it really lends itself well to some investigations. And what's interesting is that the bulk of medical research, this idea 
which should be governing all of the research, is still non-existent. So as much progress as we've made, we, we still have a long ways to go. So we're, uh, you know, historically, and I, I start this off with a pretty un uncontroversial piece of the story, which is activity or, or exercise. Throughout all of our history until very recently, we hunted, we gathered, everything that we did was in a, a highly active process. Today, we literally can count our, the number of steps that we take in, in the dozens. You can order food from online, have it delivered to your door, you could have a catheter inserted in you and you would barely need to do anything to, to provide for your day-to-day your, uh, -day needs. Um, Frank Booth, had, how many people have read this paper? Frank Booth, Exercise and Gene Expression, Physiological Regulation of the Human Genome for Physical Activity. Amazing paper, for free, open access. Highly recommend everybody check this out. Um, what was our ancestral phenotypic norm? How, how did humans just typically look? If, uh, you know, given uh, uh, the food, the exercise, the environment, the sleep that was uh, kind of typical of, of our development, this is pretty standard. From what we can tell from anthropological and archeological records, the uh, origins insertions of bones were large uh, due to the muscular activity that, that folks were doing. These weren't bodybuilders, but these were uh, not cream puffs either by, by any means. These were uh, strong people, young and old, male and female, uh, a universal feature of hu humanity up until very recently is that we were strong, fit, and, and remarkably functional. Uh, Frank Booth's paper, I'll, I'll just kind of run through this quickly. They make an argument that physical inactivity causes a failure to maintain homeostatic signaling at a genetic level. This it can inhibit health-promoting genes or activate potential disease-promoting genes or, or with uh, protein outputs. And this alteration, alteration in the intercellular environment can reach a threshold at which disease processes occur. It's interesting when you look at the epide epidemiological research, exercise doesn't appear to be 100% necessary for longevity or, or what we would call health, but it certainly seems to improve life a lot. A lot of the, the features that we see with regards to bone mineral loss, sarcopenia, uh, poor blood glucose management, all get improved with exercise. So, the controversy ensues. So usually when, I, when I'm presenting this to a number of, of doctors, I'm gonna pull this thing off because I am sweating through my jacket here. Um, people are usually pretty open to the idea that you know hunter-gatherers hunted and gathered. There's not a lot of controversy with that. When you actually talk about what they hunted and gathered, then all hell breaks loose. So uh, I, I love, love this uh, graphic for that. So here's a general uh, uh, characteristic of a paleo ancestral diet. It was largely grain legume and dairy free up until about 10,000, 12,000 years ago. This date keeps getting pushed back, um, but the, the, you know, the, the key feature with this is that as a primary nutrient source, were grains, legumes, and dairy kind of a, a primary driver, yes or no, not until the advent of agriculture. Clearly there was some playing around with this, and again, I think that there were some recent uh, archeological finds in the Middle East that pushes uh, agriculture back to like 18,000 years ago. So there's huge variants on this, but th these are just some general guidelines. Um, it's composed of seasonal local fruits and vegetables, roots and tubers, lean wild meat, fish, fowl, seafood, a balanced omega-3, omega-6 ratio, quite different than that found in modern meats, uh, nuts and seeds as available, macronutrients varied with season and locality, so there is no one paleo diet. Uh, the, it, it tends to be a qualitative focus and not so much a, a macronutrient breakdown like an Atkins or a Zone or something like that. Uh, optimum foraging strategy integrates biology and thermodynamics. Basically, we're wired to eat more, move less. Uh, using optimum foraging strategy, we and all critters that creep about, about the planet need to either find something to graze or another animal to eat. It can't run willy-nilly about doing that. It needs a strategy so that it consumes more energy than it expends in that process can think about it like going to your, your ATM. If you spend more money than you, 
you put in, then you're going to end up bankrupt. And so optimum foraging strategy and thermodynamics are a key feature of our evolutionary development, and it is something that is completely backwards in nutritional science. What does nutritional science tell us to do? Eat more, move less. Wait, right? Eat less, move more. Yes, yeah, yeah. And, and we're actually wired genetically, and, thermo and, and there's great uh, uh, arguments from optimum foraging strategy and thermodynamics that we're wired to do the exact opposite. Uh, this comes from a, a paper from uh, Lauren Cordain, plant animal subsistence ratios and macronutrient energy estimations in worldwide hunter-gatherer diets. So I'm gonna kind of make an argument here that we can use this anthropology framework and make some informed decisions, much like what we would do from epidemiology, but we're making the epidemiology start kind of from an evolutionary biology perspective. We can shift that into clinical observations, start doing both animal and human testing, and then try to find some sort of a molecular mechanism to validate our idea or invalidate the idea and keep looking. So that's kind of the process we're gonna go through. The first step along that way, uh, using clinical observation to molecular mechanism, the Catava study. Uh, this gentleman is, I believe, 101, 102 years old. Uh, 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 Katava and this is uh, Stefan Lindeberg doing some anthropometry on one of the Katavan males. Pretty, pretty fit, fit folks. Uh, horticulturalist, uh, not a mountain of physical activity, but when they uh, the stuff that they do clearly uh, works pretty well. Uh, plus the the diet that they're consuming. The Katava study I really really like when we're talking about ancestral diets because it's a diet that makes everybody angry. Um, just, just blind rage. Uh, it's built largely out of uh, yams, taro, bananas, fish, pork, coconut. It's about 60% carbohydrate, um, 15 to 25% protein, and the remainder is fat, mainly saturated fat. So the reason why this makes everybody lose their minds, the low-carb jihadis <laughs> insist that this is some sort of an aberrant part of the, the genetic human lineage and uh, uh, there's no way that any insights like this could be applied to the rest of humanity. If you come from more of the uh, forks over knives, China study realm and animal protein will give you cancer, then these guys should be dropping like flies, but we, we see none of that. And then from the American Heart Association perspective and most uh, dietitians' perspective, the amount of saturated fat that they eat, they should die in their infancy from this stuff. <laughs> but what we see is that they're largely free of cardiovascular disease, type two diabetes, li little of any indications of cancer. And it's a very, very well studied population since the 1920s. This is my Russian literature paradox point again. People say, well, what do we even really know about these people? Wow. <laughs> there have been autopsies and studies done for almost a century on them. We know quite a lot. So it's, again, it's observational. It's observational, but it's an interesting observation. It should perk some ears up and say, well, what, what's the story with that? And it did happen to perk some ears up, uh, particularly when they noticed that some things changed. Increasing rates of cardiovascular disease, uh, and other diseases of, of Western civilization, but there really wasn't much of a change in macronutrients, and that's what was really perplexing. We've been in these macronutrient wars for 60 years. Uh, it's high carb is good, no, low carb is good, no, this is good, no, that's bad, and, and uh, people, again, lose their minds over this stuff. They, they, they will practically throw a Molotov cocktail through your computer screen to make, make their point over this stuff. And, uh, Virtually everybody has been wrong about this, except a, a few people who have looked at this from an evolutionary biology perspective. Um, this is uh, an initial paper that Stefan Lindeberg and his group worked on. Um, these are guiding principles that, that Stefan actually has on, on his website about the uh, Catava study. Basic idea is foods are appropriate for any given species if they were regularly consumed throughout most of its prior evolution. Pretty reasonable. Pretty reasonable, cows eat grass. Although at the end of my talk, I'm gonna point out where cows don't actually eat grass. <laughs> but uh, plants protect themselves with bioactive substances directly aimed at animal substances which may have untoward effects on long-term human health. Everything in biology, everything that lives, creeps, crawls, has thorns, horns, shells, poison, 
Uh, we have to defend ourselves. Everything needs to defend itself. Anything that doesn't have some sort of a defense mechanism, whether it's running away or some sort of chemical or physical defense, becomes what we call a snack. And uh, <laughs> most things don't want to be a snack. And uh, some of the, the foods that we're going to check out have some particularly aggressive means of defending themselves. So what, what, uh, uh, what Stefan poses here, and again, this is his hypothesis that he's throwing out, and then he builds a really nice case for this, and I'm going to fill in some pieces to this also. Agrarian diet and diseases of affluence do evolutionarily novel dietary lectins cause leptin resistance. And why lectin and leptins have to be almost the identical word and completely different things, I have no idea, but that's the way it worked out. Um, lectins are sugar binding proteins. They're cell surface identification molecules. Uh, some are highly therapeutic. Banana lectin has is, is been found to be uh, therapeutic with HIV-1. Some are pathogenic. Ricin is a chemical warfare agent uh, derived from castor beans. Two, the, the, the amount of uh, ricin concentrated if it was the size of about two salt grains, would kill most people in this room. Few people would survive that, but that, that's how uh, deadly some of these uh, uh, lectins are. Soy, soybean antigen, uh, and it's um, proposed that some of these lectins can cause leptin resistance. Leptin is an adipose-derived neurohormone. It tends to signal appetite, regulates insulin sensitivity, and what we find is that leptin resistance precedes insulin resistance in type 2 diabetes. So the argument here, the kind of big picture argument is, OK, let's forget protein, carbs, fat. Let's look at the qualitative nature of the food. And maybe something found in Neolithic foods, grains, legumes, and possibly dairy, these lectins could cause some sort of a shift in the body. It could change things such that leptin signaling is altered, and it leads to leptin resistance, insulin resistance, and Western degenerative disease. Everybody OK with that? That's kind of the, the basic idea so far. So testing the hypothesis, uh, large differences in serum leptin levels between non-Westernized and Westernized populations, the Catava study. And you know what? I usually have a note card down here on the bottom of this thing, so I'm going to have to really be on my game to remember all the, uh, the numbers on this. About 200 folks in the Catava group, 200 folks in the Swedish westernized group were uh, checked for a number of biomarkers, uh, the, primarily, the primary one of interest being leptin. But what they found is that the Catavans had much lower uh, leptin levels, lower rates of leptin resistance, and lower rates of insulin resistance, dramatically lower than that in the westernized population. So this is kind of mark number one supporting this idea that westernized foods may be causing leptin resistance. But we, we, we just uh, only one short step along the way here. Next part of the model, uh, paleolithic diet confers higher insulin sensitivity, lower C-reactive protein, and lower blood pressure than a cereal-based diet in domestic pigs. And I think I had. Oh, I do. I do. I have that there. So some, some interesting um, <clears throat> observations with this. One, Ste Stefan's group did a really smart thing in using a porcine mo model versus a mouse model. Pigs are opportunistic omnivores and have pancre eye, pancreas, pancreases, um, pancreas eye, <laughs> quite similar to our own. So we're actually doing as close to an apples and apples comparison as, as you could get in that regard. Uh, what, we, what we found in the, the uh, paleo diet group, it had much lower C-reactive protein levels, so inflammation was much lower. It had uh, better second phase insulin sensitivity. And really interesting, as I'm going to try to tie lectins and intestinal permeability to autoimmunity in just a few minutes, there was no pancreatic leukocyte infiltration in the paleo diet group, whereas there was in the grain, grain fed group. Pancreatic leukocyte infiltration is one of the first steps that occurs in type 1 diabetes. This is the beginning of the immune inflammatory process that, that can occur in that autoimmune disease. And this may be a similar model with quite a number of autoimmune conditions. OK, the next step in testing the hypothesis, uh, paleolithic diet improves glucose tolerance more than a Mediterranean-like diet in individuals with ischemic heart disease. So let's see, what notes did I have in here? OK. I, uh, 
I think it was 13, 13 people in the in, uh, ischemic heart disease. They've either suffered a heart attack or they're type 2 diabetic. Sorry, I usually have a different type of screen here and I have my notes on there. So I'm pulling some of this stuff from uh, purely from memory. Basically, they had two groups of people that were pretty sick. Uh, insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes. Um, what they found, so this is... Um, uh, before dietary interventions, after dietary interventions, these are blood glucose levels. This is the paleo diet group, and I believe it was a 33% reduction in uh, uh, blood glucose levels. There was only a 4 or 5% reduction in blood glucose levels in the Mediterranean diet group. So this was a really, again, not a huge p-value, but a really remarkable change in the, uh, the blood glucose values for these folks. Um, more weight was lost in the paleo diet group. It was uh, difficult, if not impossible, to get the paleo diet to eat a uh, uh, weight maintenance diet. So they spon had a spontaneous uh, uh, reduction in caloric intake, which is a, a confounder, but it's also one of these things where like, well, they just quit eating food, so it's not equal. It's like one of the biggest challenges we face is how to figure out how to get people to eat less food spontaneously. So interesting stuff. Um, so where we're at is uh, we have a conspicuous lack of cardiovascular disease based off of this anthropological data. We ask the question why. Um, the uh, idea that's put out is that evolutionarily uh, novel grains containing uh, uh, potentially immunogenic leptin, uh, lectins could be at play here. We've had the Katava study, which is basically a, a big surface level epidemiological study comparing the leptin levels, and it kind of supports this idea. Then we shifted into an animal model and a human model, but now we need to look at some mechanistic testing. Do lectins actually have any type of a biological or pharmacological acti uh, activity on folks? Then we turned to celiac disease as a, a model for how different types of uh, plant proteins and lectins can actually have some pretty significant impact on our health. Um, uh, for whatever reason, gluten or gliadin proteins bond to the epithelial cells, releasing this protein called zonulin. Zonulin causes a pro-inflammatory response. Uh, the uh, gluten tends to bind to a, a substance called uh, tissue transglutaminase, and we get this haptin that is formed. And this protein then is large enough to elicit an immune response, and the adaptive immune system will attack this and the problem with this is that tissue transglutaminase is responsible for modifying most of the proteins in our body. So if we get a problem with tissue transglutaminase in one place, it's not inconceivable to have problems with tissue transglutaminase throughout the body. And this is one of the reasons why gluten issues and celiac complications can literally affect any organ, any tissue, any, any system which makes you look like a crazy person talking about this, but it doesn't mean that you're wrong. You may still be crazy, but you might actually be onto something accurate here. <laughs> so, uh, you know, what, what's occurring here is that we have um, uh, loosening of the tight junctions, intestinal contents make their way into the circulation. We also have an, uh, an outright autoimmune response occurring in the, the situation with um, celiac disease. A, a really interesting thing that I like to do is whenever we have a disease process, I like to put into a search uh, engine either Google or PubMed, disease state, evolutionary advantage. Because most of these diseases have some type of an evolutionary advantage. Uh, folks with the BRCA1, BRCA2 gene families that are the breast cancer genes, they are much less likely to become sick they are more likely to have more children. And I would, uh, there's some argument that the, the propensity for the BRCA1, BRCA2 genes to manifest as cancer are epigenetic in origin. That it, it's something late in the game that we're doing in the environment that, that may be problematic. There's some pleiotropy that occurs at, uh, late in life in some organisms, something that's beneficial for someone young, like having high testosterone levels, makes them bald later on, which makes them theoretically less, less uh, uh, attractive, although I'm losing my hair, so I hope that that's not the case. So, <laughs> but my wife, my wife probably won't, won't leave me yet, so I'm, I'm okay on that. But anyway, um, so I, I pulled this up, the evolutionary and functional analysis of celiac risk loci 
it's a protective factor against bacterial infection. Celiac disease is an autoimmune overreactivity in the gut to gluten. You, you, could, you could make an argument that way. Folks with celiac disease are much less likely to contract uh, uh, different types of parasites. or it, it, they're, they're much better able to fight them off. They have a heightened immune response in the gut. And this can have benefit under circumstances of living in a, a Neolithic uh, uh, farm environment where you're living near people and animals, uh, but it could have a deleterious effect when we live in a modern environment and we're, we're uh, uh, faced with some of the, the gluten substances that we have and not some of the other immune tuning elements that we get from the environment like a mixed microbiota and uh, uh, some, some healthy um, bacterial interaction with our, our own gut. So not everybody has celiac disease, but all grains have prolamines. Virtually all grains contain these storage proteins called prolamines. Uh, they're, they're high in protein. That proline and uh, glutamine content makes them very difficult to, to break down. Uh, Prolulin or peptidases can hydrolyze these prolamines, but unfortunately we don't really have those. If you were a termite, you would be fine but we're not, so we need some, some work around with that. There are some uh, indications that certain types of gut flora can actually hydrolyze these uh, prolamines and can really dramatically reduce the likelihood of uh, uh, gluten gliadin uh, causing immunogenic reactions. And this may be some of the problem that we see with increasing rates of celiac disease because we've altered our gut microbiota. Now maybe we're less able to deal with gluten and gliadin. Uh, we, we also tend not to soak and ferment and sprout the, the uh, uh, wheat, rye, oats, barley, and millet, the main sources of gluten, but there's a lot of different factors there. So dietary intake of wheat and other cereal grains and the role in inflammation. In this review, we discuss evidence from in vitro to in vivo and human intervention studies that describe how the consumption of wheat, but also other cereal grains can contribute to the manifestation of chronic inflammation and autoimmune disease by increasing intestinal permeability and initiating a pro-inflammatory immune response. So somewhat supporting this idea that maybe there's something two grains that are pro-inflammatory above and beyond like the protein carb fat content. Uh, and if you missed your uh, annals of the New York Academy of Sciences, tight junctions, intestinal permeability, and autoimmunity, don't worry, I got it for you. Um, <laughs> celiac disease and type 1 diabetes paradigms, there's growing evidence that increased intestinal permeability plays a pathogenic role in various autoimmune diseases, including celiac disease and type 1 diabetes. Therefore, we hypothesize that besides the genetic and environmental factors, loss of intestinal barrier function is necessary to develop autoimmunity. This is, was just like head spinning stuff when I finally started seeing some, some research on this because it would, getting into this nearly 20 years ago, the idea, uh, the concept of intestinal permeability or leaky gut, if you put that out and you were an academic, it was career suicide. You were done. And now over the course of time, it, this is possibly the hottest area of, of immunology and health research that exists. So it, it's kind of, a, kind of an interesting process and definitely a very validating one for me. So the etiology of autoimmune diseases, I'm just going to kind of jam through this stuff. Um, infection, geography, higher latitudes tend to increase risk, theoretically due to lower vitamin D levels. Physical trauma, crushing uh, type injuries can increase um, uh, autoimmune risk. Vaccinations, adjuvants, the adjuvants oftentimes used in vaccinations are lectins, like uh, quilaha from, uh, that's used in um, root beer, root beer. It, it, it's a, an immune adjuvant. It irritates the immune system so that you get a more potent uh, immune response. Um, man, there's a lot of stuff there. Okay, uh, known or suspected autoimmune diseases that are also present with a leaky gut. As far as I understand, every autoimmune disease that has been checked for intestinal permeability has presented with intestinal permeability. Does not mean cause and effect, but it should be something that's very intriguing. Um, there is a proposed mechanism here implicating uh, intestinal permeability being necessary to develop an autoimmune condition. I don't know that that is 100% shored up by any means, but it should at least be a, an intriguing byline in that regard. And uh, yeah, about 33% of uh, all autoimmune diseases 
uh, have been checked for it so far. So where we're at, um, we, I'm going to show you a model where Neolithic foods increase gut permeability and that can lead to autoimmunity. And we're also going to talk about how uh, the Neolithic foods increase gut permeability, but that can lead into insulin and leptin resistance. These are kind of the two bifurcating paths that we have that both relate to intestinal permeability. Um, if you guys are regretting showing up at this event, the other speakers will be much better than I am. So just <laughs> hang in there. Um, gut permeability and metabolic syndrome. Again, this is the talk that I usually use for uh, kind of like hospital systems. It's kind of a shock and odd deal, so I apologize. But I see some people that are like trying to garrote themselves with their tie right now. Um, so gut permeability and, and metabolic syndrome. Um, uh, insulin resistance brings about the, the metabolic syndrome or these things are, are intimately tied together. This is characterized by increased triglycerides, decreased HDL cholesterol, increased insulin, and a tendency towards increased hypertension. Uh, increased intestinal permeability and tight junction alterations in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. The conclusions, our results provide the first evidence that non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in humans is associated with increased gut permeability and that this abnormality is related to the increased prevalence of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth in these patients. The increased permeability appears to be caused by disruption of the intracellular tight junctions in the intestine, and it may play an important role in the pathogenesis of hepatic fat deposition. Uh, I don't know if you guys follow Peter Atia at all, but he's been championing um, uh, 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 trying to bring more attention to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. This condition is, is just exploding. It's in this mix of uh, metabolic syndrome, metabolic problems, and uh, it's incredibly expensive to deal with because it's typically a liver transplant, but it's also this frustrating thing because it is completely reversible. This is a, a metabolic-driven process. If we reduce glycemic load, particularly from, from uh, the correct sources, you can reverse this process pretty, pretty effectively. Um, now, the thing that is at play with some of this inflammation is this stuff called lipopolysaccharide. Lipopolysaccharide activates an innate immune system response in human adipose tissue in obesity and type 2 diabetes. Our results suggest that type 2 diabetes is associated with increased endotoxemia. Endotoxemia is an increase in the products that are shed from bacteria and they make their way into our circulation. Uh, Sepsis-induced changes in pancreatic hormone secretion, extreme insulin resistance typifies the septic patient. This is something that most doctors forget rather quickly is that the septic patient, the individual, say, who has had a bowel nicked and they become septic, they look almost indistinguishable from the poorly controlled type 2 diabetic, as we're going to look at here in a minute. Um, uh, insulin resistance characterizes the septic patient, and it seems that the balance between insulin and its counter-regulatory hormones, cort cortisol, glucagon, growth hormone, and catecholamines is perturbed in the metabolic response to sepsis. It seems that one of the metabolic problems during sepsis is an inability to use free fatty acids as a metabolic substrate. Sound familiar to type, type 2 diabetes? Uh, the liver's function as a regulator of glycemia is also disrupted as a result of hepatic insulin resistance. This results in increased hepatic glucose output, initially as a result of glycogenolysis, but later from gluconeogenesis. So what happens, initially, the muscles become insulin resistant. And this, this is, again, we could be talking about type 2 diabetes, development of type 2 diabetes, or this process occurring in a matter of minutes, almost seconds, in the case of sepsis, but they're virtually identical. The muscles become insulin resistant. Free fatty acids are released by the adipose tissue, even though we really don't need them. We're, we're awash in excess energy. Uh, the liver perceives low blood sugar. Cortisol is released and other, other uh, uh, glycogen, glycogenolytic uh, hormones are released. River, liver releases lipids and glucose. Inflammatory signaling increases, which feeds this whole process even further. High levels of blood glucose, free fatty acids, and tissue insulin resistance ensue. Um, liver becomes backlogged with glucose and glycogen. Synthesis of VLDLs increase. VLDL shifts to a pattern BLDL cholesterol, which is the small, dense, atherogenic stuff. And we're going to find out why it tends to do that in just a, just a second. Um, Systemic inflammation increases, 
Appetite signaling is essentially lost. Leptin, adipinopectin, PYY, cholecystokinin are basically offline. Low sugar swing from high to low. That cannot ad adequately be ac accessed for fuel, fuel in some cases, but really what's happening is that fat, glucose, everything is being dumped into si the system even though we're awash with energy. Um, dyslipidemia and inflammation, an evolutionarily conserved mechanism. In inflammation leads to changes in lipid metabolism leading, uh, aimed at decreasing the toxicity of a variety of harmful agents and tissue repair by redistributing nutrients to cells involved in host defense. Acute phase response mediated by cytokines prevents the host from acute injury. When this inflammation becomes chronic, it may lead to chronic disorders such as atherosclerosis and metabolic syndrome. So what's happening here is in that endotoxemia state when we are awash with this stuff called lipopolysaccharide, which I'm gonna talk about a little bit more in a second, it causes an inflammatory response. This initial inflammatory response actually protects the liver to some degree because if the liver gets overwhelmed with the lipopolysaccharide, that can lead to the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and some other problems. But the inflammatory response is also increasing insulin resistance and causing its own, own bag of uh, difficulties. Uh, this is an E. coli uh, gram-negative gram bacteria. This is what uh, uh, lipopolysaccharide looks like. It's a, a long, kind of jagged molecule that's used in uh, uh, cell surface recognition, but it causes a incredibly potent response in essentially all vertebrate organisms. Uh, when we get an infection that, that puts lipopolysaccharide into us, we respond very, very violently, again, with this kind of uh, uh, mimicked profile that looks very similar to a type 2 diabetic. So this is where the immune system gets interesting with regard to LPS and, uh, and all of the story. LPS binding protein, lipopolysaccharide binding protein, circulates in association with ApoB containing lipoproteins and enhances endotoxin LDL, VLDL interaction. Our lipoproteins, HDLs, LDLs, these things that we usually associate with cardiovascular disease, are actually part of the innate immune response. And an important job that they do is to scoop up things like lipopolysaccharide and remove them from the system before they can become injurious to us. And this is where we see that process. Lipopolysaccharide enters the system. Uh, lipopolysaccharide binding protein, if it attaches to this, can then bind to HDL and also the other lipoproteins. And then it is effectively neutralized. If this doesn't happen, then the lipopolysaccharide binds to a CD14 cell and this induces a pro-inflammatory response. So it, this is another thing. The medical community almost solely looks at cholesterol and lipoproteins as uh, heart issues or atherogenic issues. It's an immune issue. They're critical to the immune response. And interestingly, people who, I'll throw this out there, so lipoproteins and cholesterol remove lipopolysaccharide from the circulation, potentially. What would happen in an individual with super low cholesterol levels if they became septic? Are they more or less likely to survive? Less. Interesting, huh? So this is an evolutionary trade-off. Too high of lipoproteins in cholesterol can increase atherogenic potential under certain circumstances. Too low of lipoproteins in cholesterol can increase likelihood of death due to infection. So there's some evolutionary trade-offs there. Really quickly about lipoproteins, this is another thing that is largely un unknown within the, the bulk of the medical community. Uh, everybody's had their uh, cholesterol levels checked and you've seen your HDL, LDL. LDL cholesterol refers to the actual cholesterol in these lipoproteins. Lipoproteins are these uh, water-soluble protein packages that carry lipids throughout the body. We can have an individual that has an LDL cholesterol of 100, but they only have a few large buoyant uh, particles or we can have an individual with an LD, LDL cholesterol of 100, and they have many, many small, potentially atherogenic particles. So simply looking at LDL cholesterol levels is a very poor metric 
for gauging cardiovascular disease risk. A much better gauge is LDL particle count. But even that is not 100% uh, uh, story. We have individuals that can have quite high LDL particle counts, but yet they have uh, low insulin levels, low inflammatory state. Is that person really at high risk for a cardiac event? We don't know. So just some, some other interesting stuff to keep in mind. Um, the drug metformin is pretty interesting as it prevents endotoxin-induced liver injury after uh, uh, partial removal of the liver. Metformin is a, a rather old diabetes drug, and it's very interesting. It improves intestinal permeability. It, it prevents the intestinal permeability from being a problem. It improves uh, insulin signaling at the liver and the muscles, and also it mitigates LPS damage to the liver. So metformin is a really interesting drug kind of uh, model for looking at this problem because it undoes, it, it, in its process of undoing diabetes, it's undoing a number of different factors all at the same time. Oral and gastrointestinal symptoms of metformin protects against the development of fructose-induced ketosis in mice the role of the intestinal barrier function. The protective effects of the metformin treatment on the onset of fructose-induced non-alcoholic fatty liver disease were associated with a protection against the loss of tight junction proteins, occludin and zonula occludins 1, in the duodenum of fructose-fed mice and the increased translocation of bacterial endotoxin found in mice only fed with fructose. So what, what metformin does is it dramatically reduces the endotoxemia that can be caused from fructose overfeeding. Again, it's, it's so uh, uh, a diabetes drug can undo some of the problems of a diabetes, diabetogenic um, substance, fructose, but perhaps reducing fructose or sugar load would be a smart idea too. And again, the reason why it's doing that is it's reducing uh, uh, intestinal permeability in that process. Taken together, these data suggest that metformin not only protects the liver from the onset of fructose-induced non-alcoholic fatty liver disease <clears throat> through mechanisms involving its direct effects on the hepatic insulin signaling, but rather through altering intestinal permeability and subsequently the endotoxin-dependent activation of hepatic Kupfer cells. So it, 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 every once in a while I'll tweet about uh, metformin. I'll say, metformin, the wonder drug, and a couple of crusty docs will be like, yeah, I've been using it for 60 years. What do you want, kid? You know, and, and it's like, <laughs> well, did you know that you know, part of what it's doing is reducing intestinal permeability? And then they say, leaky gut's uh, quackery. You know? And so it, it just kind of goes from there. But it's really interesting <clears throat> to me in kind of validating of this whole process. OK, back to the Katavans. Um Contribution of leptin receptor and leak glycans to leptin binding. The extracellular domain of the human leptin receptor contains 20 potential and glycosylation sites. These are binding points for uh, uh, potential leptin and uh, uh, binding sites on this particular protein. We found that mammalian cells express this SBOR gene fragment. Binding was inhibited by concannabinoid A or wheat germ agglutinin. What this basically means is that um, wheat germagglutinin or concannabinoid A, which is a, a derivative out of a, a bean extract, both of these can block the ability for leptin to bind to the leptin receptor. So we have kind of an, an additional mechanistic validation on this idea that Stefan Lindeberg put forward that lectins could be a problem with regards to leptin resistance. And in multiple ways, one is that they can cause intestinal permeability and therefore increase inflammatory signaling, which damages, damages leptin. And then now it appears in a direct fashion by actually inhibiting the binding of leptin to recept, uh, leptin receptor sites. Uh, gluten exorphin B5 stimulates prolactin secretion through the opioid receptors located outside the blood-brain barrier. Gluten exorphin B5 is a food-derived opioid peptide identified in digestive wheat gluten. We have recently shown that GEB5 stimulates prolactin secretion through opioid receptors located outside the blood-brain barrier. Since opioid peptides do not exert their effect on the PRL se secretion directly, but the uh, reduced dopaminergic tone, our data suggests that GEB5 can modify brain neurotransmitter relief without crossing the blood-brain barrier. Holy smokes. OK, what does that mean? Glu gluten uh, uh, digest can actually stimulate release 
of hormones within the brain without crossing the blood-brain barrier. My whole point to this is that we have a mechanism in which lectin or plant-derived type proteins similar to lectins have essentially a pharmacological effect. They clearly have a physiological effect, but they, it, it ranks up there with pharmacological effect. So they can penetrate the gut barrier, they can alter the way that receptor sites are modified, and they can actually cause the release of various types of hormones in the body. So we are at this spot. We have the catavins, uh, interesting lack of disease, anthropological observation. We shifted into clinical observations. There was a difference between leptin levels between catavins and Swedes. We did some further validation with animal and human trials. Uh, the clinical testing shifted to some mechanistic theory. Are lectins and anti-nutrients actually biologically active? Yeah, they can be. Sure looks like it. Uh, permeable gut key is key in autoimmunity and metabolic syndrome. So we're close to getting some mechanistic validation. But let me throw this one out there. Um, this is a great paper, by the way. Like this one is just amazing. Comparison with ancestral diets suggests dense acellular carbohydrates promote an inflammatory microbiota and may be the primary dietary cause of leptin resistance and obesity. Hmm. So acellular carbohydrates are refined carbs. Bananas, apples, uh, e even legitimately whole grains, pearled barley that has been soaked and then heated and not milled in some fashion. The carbohydrate is still within a cell wall matrix, which is typical, typical of plants. There appears to be some mechanism in which when we consume carbohydrates that are cellular in nature, we beneficially feed the gut microbiota, we minimize the insulin response to the food, and this is why we see a huge spectrum of ancestral diets with regards to carbohydrate and fat intake that all seem to be incredibly healthy. The one commonality that they have is that they don't eat refined carbohydrates, particularly refined grains. That's the one, one thing that we really have in common. Um, this paper basically builds an incredible argument that it may not be anything to do with lectins in this whole story. So this is just something that I want to throw out there for you to say, huh, okay, I do think that lectins play a role in this story, and, and more specifically, immunogenic proteins. People have focused too much on lectins specifically. There's a whole host of different types of proteins from different plants that may have an immunogenic role, but even that story is complex. Do they have a role because we've been eating acellular carbohydrate, which has shifted our gut bacteria in an unfavorable way, and now we can't deal with things like gluten and casein because we actually just have a damaged gut because of refined carbohydrate. The whole point to this, hopefully, the, the takeaway, though, is that this is a very testable story. It's not a super, it, it maybe looks a little bit complex, but really compared to a lot of problems that are tackled in medicine and biology, it's not that complex of a question. And it's a really solvable issue from a clinical medicine standpoint, which is largely why we're here. You can do interventions that basically it's like you drop a marble down kind of a, a ping pong deal, and it's like, well, we tried this. Okay, that didn't work. Okay, we tried that. And we can get most people to a spot where they are free of these Western degenerative diseases, which is, is really amazing. But none of this came about, whether it was Stefan Lindeberg's observation or, or these authors, none of this came about without an evolutionary medicine ancestral health perspective that drove the process. We've been driving the process from trying to understand pathology is the first point. We need to drive this process from an evolutionary medicine perspective first. Almost done. Just wanted to point this out. Again, I mentioned it a little bit earlier, uh, but when I first got into this gig, uh, if you poked around PubMed and you put it, uh, you searched for intestinal permeability, you got about two, three hundred responses. Now there's nearly, uh, uh, there, there's over ten thousand of them now. But it's interesting. The first. And I, I did, did this on my wife's computer, so I knew that it, it was clean, like it wasn't <laughs> geeked up. But the second response, the second prompt was intestinal permeability. That was quackery 20 years ago. People were run out on a rail for even talking about this 20 years ago. Which is, you know, we need to have evidence-based medicine, but at the same time, the evidence-based medicine crowd hides behind everything that is not a randomized controlled trial. 
the next time I'm in a discussion with some of these folks about this, I want to walk up and hammer one of them on the foot with a, with a sledgehammer, say, and they're like, why did you do that? I'm like, it didn't hurt. And they're like, it broke my foot. I'm like, where's the randomized control trial? <laughs> Prove it. You know? So <laughs> that gets a little bit extreme, but you know, we, 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 uh, we, we can't let this devolve into um, chaos, cavemen, you know, we, we, need to, we need to keep some, some grounding. But at the same time, the things that we're proposing can be handled in a, a clinical outcomes-based level. We don't need massive governmental interventions. We just need to free up our doctors to let them practice the type of medicine that's going to help people. And, and that's how we're going to fix this thing. So, yeah. Um, I, I wanted to throw this one out just, just really quickly, and I'm, I'm really almost done. Um, 12 years ago, Lauren Cordain and I were, were talking, and I was like, hey, Huntington's disease. That's wacky. Um, Huntington's disease, it, it's, a, it's a, a, a gene repeat disease, and it, it tends to uh, develop into a fatal neurological condition. I said, you know, it's kind of interesting. Um, have you read the, the studies on the uh, non-westernized Huntington's carriers? And he's like, no. What's the deal with that? I'm like, they don't really express the disease. Hmm, really? So what I did is I went up to a search engine and I put in Huntington's disease, metabolic derangement, or insulin resistance, actually. Didn't really get that much. I went to, cleared that search term and put in Huntington's disease transglutaminase. And we found all kinds of stuff. And we've found this related to malignant melanomas and on and on and on. Lauren and I cooked up a hundred different PhD projects which are waiting to be done, um, uh, largely looking at stuff like this. Uh, the, if you recall, the tissue transglutaminase is where the intestinal permeability is, is derived from gluten input. Um, other proteins can cause uh, transglutaminase cross-reactivity and autoimmune response and whatnot, but uh, gluten is a biggie in that story. And I, we have some proposed mechanisms both for Huntington's disease and for malignant melanoma. I have an argument, I don't know if it's true, but this is the hypothesis, I'm throwing it out there. I have an argument that without the proper environmental trigger, which I think is gluten or gluten type proteins, malignant melanoma can't happen. Does that sound interesting? Does that sound like a worthy research goal for somebody to look into? We haven't found anybody to champion it yet. And we have it very, very well detailed. So maybe somebody watching this, listening to this, will decide to uh, pick that up. And I will give you everything that we've done on it. But it's an uh, it's, uh, interesting, um, just kind of an interesting insight. Uh, my friend Pedro Bastos was the author of this paper. Uh, and, and there was a closing point on this, which I think is fantastic. The physical activity, sleep, sun, exposure, and dietary needs of every living organism, including humans, are genetically determined. Bam. You could say epigenetically, too, because gut microbiota has a whole lot to say in that. But that's a, another thing. Just really quickly, I did a, a participated in a pilot program with this outfit, Specialty Health in Reno. Uh, we found 33 individuals that were at high risk for type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. They were uh, police and firefighters. Uh, program cost was $1,000 per person. We implemented a lowish carb paleo type diet, modified their sleep, got them exercising better. Program savings are a very conservative uh, 20 to 1 with uh, uh, ROI and a $22 million save prorated over a 20 year period. And I've been working the last couple of years trying to figure out how to take this model and scale it out to the masses, trying to integrate this with gyms and farms and the Savory Institute and sustainability so that we've got a decentralized, resilient network that provides evolutionary medicine and feeds us in a way that doesn't destroy the planet. What do you think? Cool. OK, cool. Now, as great as that is, there was a, uh, uh, there was a guy, uh, Ricardo Salvador, who was getting ready to take over the Leopold Center for Sustainable Agriculture in Iowa. And he had run the gauntlet, uh, uh, you know, this academic proce process, uh, uh, trying to take over this academic position. It was a day before he was to be appointed. He was pr uh, giving a, a news briefing. And as part of that briefing, he said, cows evolved to eat grass. Grass is the preferred food for cows. The next day, he was dismissed. And he was out of there. Iowa receives more corn subsidies than anybody on the planet. 
So there was a big hoopla about this. The gal who runs the school, uh, Leopold Center for Sustainable Ag Agriculture, uh, Wendy Winterstein, was interviewed about this. And the interviewer said, point blank, do you believe that cows evolved to eat grass? And she said, I have no comment on that. <laughs> so yeah, it's kind of like unicorns and sunshine on the one hand, and then it's kind of like holy smokes on the other. So again, we've, we've come a long ways, but we have a lot of stuff to do. And that's what I've got for you. so much. So just before we move on to questions, I just wanted to go over some general uh, guidelines so that everyone is comfortable. Um, so if you want to ask a question, first I would like you to state your name before asking the question. And to be clear, um, Rob or any of our future speakers cannot provide medical advice or answer medical questions about your individual health situation. So please do not ask them to. In addition, um, make sure your question is stated as a question, that there's actually an answer, that it's not just a comment. Um, we know that you're all very passionate about this issue, and we very much appreciate that. And we know you have strong opinions, but we would like clear questions so that everyone in the audience can benefit from them and make it specific. Uh, lastly, please be concise and to the point so that we can allow for as many questions as possible. And now I'll turn it over for the Q&A. Yes, sir. Um, thanks for that wonderful talk. Um, I just wanted to state one thing. I couldn't agree more that randomized controlled trials have no validity really in medicine except testing drugs versus non-drug modalities. Uh, I'm in the neurofeedback area, and there is no way to do a placebo-controlled trial against so many forms of exercise. You can't do it. You can't do fake push-ups. So I, I just love your making that point. Um, and my question, because I'm sort of getting old and I don't listen as fast as I once did, is there any way we can get a hold of your PowerPoint? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I can make that available. Sure. Yeah. And then we'll, we'll just zigzag back and forth. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, my name is Rick Morris. I'm doing a uh, PhD in philosophy, which is in conceptual issues around some of this stuff. Nice. And uh, my question is, speak up, speak up. Or I'll just talk louder. I can everybody hear me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I've got a big mouth. So, uh, <laughs> so it seems like sometimes there's a little bit of slipperiness between talking about uh, reproductive fitness and evolutionary adaptation and health. It's not quite the same thing. Uh, and so I'm, I'm curious if you have just any comments on how to kind of view those apart in a sort of a uh, properly motivated way. Mm -hmm. OK, this is an opinion piece. Uh, uh, but I've seen a lot of folks in the evolutionary medicine establishment get incredibly prickly about all this, almost like they're kind of like, these are my toys and I don't want these exercise scientists and, and physicians coming in and, and playing with this. So they'll get really pedantic about like, you know, sexual reproductive fitness versus all these other elements. Um, the basic story here is one of discordance. You know, so th this is a, a common theme throughout the whole story. And there's trade-offs that, you, you know, uh, uh, the, the uh, example of celiac is a great one. You know, increased immune reactivity in the gut uh, may reduce the likelihood of infection, but it may increase the, the likelihood of celiac disease and some other problems. The thing that makes me crazy about a lot of the evolutionary medicine scene that is in these hair-splitting discussions is that I was, I, I partic I've been on the Naval Special Warfare Resiliency Committee for about six years. I go to these events speaking to the SEALs and special boat team members, and somehow I ended up at this Chatham House Rules event, which is basically an event where um, nobody can say what, who said what at an event, and this is to get people to kind of go outside the box and, and say some crazy stuff. And what was said there is that our medical system is an existential threat to the security of the United States. <laughs> And so these evolutionary biology bigwigs who 
we, we would love to have them embrace this thing. They're, they're kind of like, I do not know if I want to, you know, acknowledge you, and, you know, and, and it, it, while our society is collapsing around our ears. So this paleo diet thing maybe doesn't have all the pieces together. Let's have those folks come in, help us explain this in a more articulate way and get our eyes dotted and our T's crossed, and let's avert this catastrophe before we can't. And I don't know if that directly answers your question, but that's the one I've got for you. Okay, cool. Awesome. Yes. Hi, my name is Heather Jurgensen. I'm a blogger at thestrongwoman.net, and I'm interested in learning more about the anthropology of food and human health, which you got into with, was it the Catavans? And, and I, I'm wondering if you can recommend any books or writers specifically on the anthropological side, some, something like I'm thinking Weston Price and looking at different primitive ancestors. Yeah, features. there's a, a one book that's amazing. It, actually, Richard Lee, mm -hmm. and uh, he has a book, uh, Kung San, Men, Women, and Work in a Foraging Society, mm -hmm. is amazing. And once you find him and that book, he has a number of books, like and the then the, the linkages back and forth on that are Richard phenomenal. Lee? Richard Lee. Lee, okay, thank yeah, you. Sure. Oh. Okay. So I am an Thank you, but their doctors have told them that that's not going to really work for them. Uh, basic idea is that uh, uh, she uh, treats a number of, of folks who um, suffer from breast, breast cancer. Uh, she's kind of steered them towards something that looks like a paleo type diet. These folks feel dramatically better, but their docs are pretty concerned about it. Um, I'll be honest, you know, once the cancer process is underway, it's a very different story. Um, the, you know, this is some of where the, the uh, China study data is very misleading. Um, animals that were fed a high protein diet uh, 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 fought off the carcinogenic effects of aflatoxin longer than low protein intake animals. But once they developed cancer, higher protein intake ended up accelerating the cancer. The problem with T. Colin Campbell is he ignored the fact that the protein was protective against carcinogenic effects. He only focused on the fact that protein intake was kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, promoting cancer growth. So that, that's an incredibly slippery spot that I, I, I don't know how to uh, comment on that other than there seems to be some really interesting research from like uh, Dominic D'Agostino who's in, in Florida, Tom Seyfried mm -hmm. looking specifically at ketogenic diets and even some folks are um, uh, modifying the ketogenic diets so that the protein intake is really minimizing the gluconeogenic uh, amino acids so that we're, we're potentially trying to feed the cancer the, as, as least as possible. But even that said, there are clear indications in the literature with certain types of cancer, like malignant melanoma, if it gets exposed to a ketogenic diet environment, it emboldens and, and uh, increases its, its uh, uh, growth incredibly. So there aren't any uniform stories to that. And I, I could make an argument for a low nutrient diet. I don't know that feeding cancer patients sugar is the smartest thing, which is generally what's being done. But at the same time, um, this thing is rapidly growing. Do you really want to provide it the most uh, robust substrates possible? I, I, I don't know. I, I just flat don't know. Is there a diet that you would say, oh? A ketogenic diet is the most intriguing diet out there for me with regards to cancer. But even that has some massive caveats to it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And Doc, what, what's my timeline? Um, two more. Two more, okay. Hello, my name is Wendy Murray, and I am here because um, I have an autoimmune disease. And I'm curious about that angle, and mostly regarding insurance. Um, everything that we re research online um, is very interesting, but also there's so much information, and it's so confusing where to start. You need a functional medicine person to help you, and insurance doesn't cover that. So how much advocacy is there out there in these communities to get insurance to understand this information? 
Oh man. Oh man. <laughs> um, so I, I threw this gauntlet out on my Facebook page the other day that I'm going to write a book about kind of the American healthcare system and kind of some of my takes on it. I've been taking notes and write. I, I have about 40,000 words written in this direction already, but it's been kind of an ongoing snowballing effect. The, some of the effects of the Ameri Affordable Care Act include a provision where um, insurance companies can only make 20% profit from the dues that they collect. 80% needs to be allocated to patient care which makes seems like reasonable, but if they develop a really whiz-bang innovation that saves them a lot of money, it cuts into the, it, it, it doesn't change. They just have to cut a check to their, their subscribers in that network. Let me do a little math question here. If the only way that insurance companies can make money is to make 20% off of what they take, how do they make more money? Charge Increase premiums. That is the sole mechanism that they, they have currently for doing this stuff. So I, this again isn't directly answering your question. We have a massively broken system. I mean like it, it, it's a disaster and um, what I've been advocating strongly for is the development and implementation of health savings accounts even for the poor uh, so that that money is theirs. It's, their, it's, it's real healthcare dollars that can then be allocated any way that that individual wants. And that also circumvents the three-party payer system where you're my doctor, I'm the patient, and someone else is the insurance company. Neither you nor I care what they pay and then they are going to try to pay you as little as possible and charge me as much as possible. So the uh, HSA health savings account process creates, it, it's as if you were going to the store and buying something instead of a third party process, which is what we have. Is there anybody out there who's really, um, do you think there's anybody out there who's really ma making this their core thing? Like there's so much great information, but um, do you think there's some? So the, the last four years I've been working on trying to scale this risk assessment program and take it out to the masses. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason why I've been so stymied is the things that we could do that would cause an innovative shift. There is no aligned incentive in the system to do that currently. So we are not sure exactly where to go. The one place that we may be able to go are these things called captive insurers. This is where a company creates its own insurance company as a wealth management strategy. And so these captives are actually highly motivated to reduce costs. And interestingly, the, the entity that insures the Reno Police, Reno Fire Department is a captive insurer. Okay. So the place that we may start this whole process is with captive insurers, but you know, like, uh, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, Primera, like they can't, the, 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 the incentives are not aligned, unfortunately, which is maddening. So hang in there. All right. Thank yeah. you very much. And oh, okay, one, one more. Yeah. Hi, I'm Cynthia Ballou. I'm on faculty in the Nurse Midwifery Education Program here at UCSF. Um, I had a question about acellular carbohydrates, which is, seems really important to me, given what a lot of paleo and gluten-free people are eating. And what, what are acellular carbohydrates? Like, is any flour, like tapioca flour, like do we know what falls into that category? So let, let's say what is definitely cellular carbohydrate. Fruits, vegetables, roots, tubers. Um, if you, cook, ate, you know, cooked and ate some pinto beans, that's still in the cellular carbohydrate deal. Um, blend those pinto beans up to make refried beans, and you're breaking down some of the cellular matrix. I think you would have a mix with that. Uh, uh, you know, if you mortar and pestle it, it's only going to be a little bit. If you flip it in a Cuisinart for 20 minutes, it's, it, it's going to be totally different. So uh, yeah, and you know, but, but an interesting sideline with, with that, uh, Jeff Leach's work with the, um, the Hudsa, they eat sugar by the, or uh, honey by the pounds. 
but they don't get these negative gut inflammatory shifts. But they're also climbing the trees and eating the larvae and doing all this other stuff, and they don't do that throughout the whole year. They have a block of time where they eat a ton of honey. But clearly, that's a, an acellular carbohydrate, and we don't see a negative gut microbiota shift with them. But it's a really, it, it, it's an interesting model. It's something that I think is reasonably easy for people to wrap their heads around, also easy to test. But yeah. Uh, Tapioca flour, um, even, it really calls into question even potentially uh, uh, things like uh, almond flour and whatnot. But again, this is, it, it, uh, you gotta figure out you know, what's livable versus you know, some sort of ideal that just blows everybody out of water. Well, yeah. It seems like there's an epidemic of SIBO, or at least it's on our radar now, and the, the connection of acellular carbohydrates with SIBO seems really important. Yeah, in that, that paper that I mentioned, it's a free open access paper. If you just put in acellular carbohydrate into a search engine, you'll get it. It is amazing. It should be a first year, first day reading for any dietitian, doctor, healthcare provider. It is amazing. Yeah. Thank you guys for coming. Huge honor to be here.